Begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray, pray for, for us sinners, sinners now, now and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. Holy martyrs, pray, pray for, for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'm going to share my screen. Today we're going to talk about the new apostolic letter issued by Pope Francis. Desiderio Desideravi, um, issued yesterday, right? Yeah, yesterday on the feasts of the Holy Apostles, Peter and Paul. Um, so the, the title comes from here. He has at the beginning here, um, Desiderio Desideravi, Hocascum and Ducari Vobiscum and Tipum Patia. So it's from Luke 22, 15, roughly translated as he has here, the Holy Father has in paragraph two, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So this is, as he says here, on the liturgical formation of the people of God. So it's an apostolic letter on the liturgy. So this is, of course, a year ago in July, he, he issued um, the motu proprio, traditionis custodis. Um, and then we've had some other uh, talk about the liturgy from uh, high-ranking churchmen and some little comments here and there from the Pope. So it seems in the past year or so, I don't recall, do you remember him saying much about the liturgy before that? No. No, uh, I don't either. So it seems like in the past year or so, he's taken more of an interest in the liturgy. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with his... Um, it has a lot to do with the Second Vatican Council, which is what he, he references here in this apostolic letter. Um, so in the mind of the Holy Father, the the liturgy, so this when we, when we talk about the liturgy now, we're talking about the liturgy of 1970, the, the reform under Pope Paul VI is linked intrinsically to the Second Vatican Council. And he'll reference the document um, the Second Vatican from the Second Vatican Council uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium on the liturgy. So that's what that is when we come to it. So I'm going to go through here and um, just highlight some things and discuss this. So Kevin, if you have any questions or comments, you see anything, and then uh, Tom, can you hear me? He's driving to South Carolina, so yeah. If he's if he's even here, we'll go through. Yeah, I'm here. I can okay. hear you. I just have you on. Uh, so if I if I need to pop in, I'll pop in, but I'll probably be mostly radio silent. Okay, good. Ten four. Uh, let's make I'll do that. Robert Ducky. Yeah. All right. Let's go here. So he begins, my dearest brothers and sisters, with this letter, I desire to reach you all after having written already only to the bishops after the publication of the motu proprio traditionis custodes, and I write to share with you some reflections on the liturgy, a dimension fundamental for the life of the church. The theme is vast and always deserves an attentive consideration in every one of its aspects. Even so, with this letter, I do not intend to treat the question in an exhaustive way. I simply desire to offer some prompts or cues for reflection that can aid in the contemplation of the beauty and truth of Christian celebration. So then it says here, going to paragraph two, the liturgy, the, the quote unquote, today of salvation. What does it mean to, to today of salvation? Well, what the Holy Father is pointing to here is um, the kind of sacrifice that the, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is, the kind of sacrifice that the Eucharist is. When Christ says, do this in memory of me, that is an anamnesis. So in a, in a real way, the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is made present to us. Just as when the Jews would celebrate the Passover, in a, in, a, in a less real way, but in a way that's super symbolic, the, the, the first Passover was made present to them. Um, that's what he's talking about, the today. So it's, it's ever new. So I will go through some of this. Um, he quotes Luke twenty two fifteen. These words of Jesus, with which the account of the Last Supper opens, are the crevice through which we are given the surprising possibility of intuiting the depth of the love of the persons of the Most Holy Trinity for us. Peter and John were sent to make preparations to eat that Passover, but in actual fact, all of creation, all of history, which at last was on the verge of revealing itself as the history of salvation, 
was a huge preparation for that supper. So I, I like this. He's saying that <clears throat> the Holy Father is saying that all of history, which with the incarnation, and he'll reference the incarnation quite a bit in this apostolic letter, which I, I also like. Um, so there's some real strengths in this, and there's some uh, some things that I think might be a little problematic or uh, not as neat as he would like it. But what he does do is is show how with the word being made flesh and then the word giving his flesh and blood for us on Calvary, but also before that in the upper room, salvation history is, is brought to a culmination or, or history really merges with salvation history and that all of creation was preparing for this Pascha, this Passover of the Lamb of God, the, the Son of God to give, him, give himself. Paragraph four, no one had earned a place at that supper. All had been invited. Um, it is true, everyone there had come there by invitation. Um, now, now, some of this language, I'm not going to uh, judge the Holy Father here, but what we see sometimes, uh, if you've read... Kevin, have you read any of other, his other, um, like, Traditionis Custodes or... Uh, a little bit of them. Even uh, the, the, the first one, the, uh, the earliest one, Laudato Si. Laudato Si, yeah. other ones. Yeah. So what you'll see is the way he writes. It's not... It, it's not... Um, how can I word this? It's not typically papal. It's not the way we've been used. It's definitely not the way that Benedict XVI wrote or when you go back to some of the other ones. So the, it can be a little loose. So you have to look for, um, you, ha you have to, you have to really read the whole thing and then, and then look at it through a Catholic lens. So all had been invited. We're, he's not saying that everyone's invited to the altar to receive the Eucharist. Um, he does clarify later. When I, when I read this, it seemed a little loose to me, some of the language um, it's easy to be critical of Pope Francis, uh, but I, so I was trying, I was trying to read it, not, I'm not trying to pick it apart, because I really didn't care for Traditionis Custodis the way it was done, obviously, I mean, it, he has the right to do that, I thought it was heavy handed, and I think some of the, uh, the, the church hierarchy, some of the cardinals and uh, uh, other bishops that implemented it, like um, Supich in Chicago have in implemented it in a way that's uh, very heavy handed, unnecessarily so. Um, I didn't care for that. And, and we're used to, sadly, we're used to as Catholics, and I'm not a cradle Catholic, but we're used to hearing very wishy washy language when it comes to the Eucharist. Like all are invited, all can come forward. But anyway, that's not what he's saying here. He's saying that no one earns this. That's true. This is a complete self gift by the Son of God. Um, as he says, they're drawn there by their burning desire by the burning desire that Jesus had to eat the Passover with him. So I'm going to go through some of this, but the point he's making here is that, and this is a very important point, um, everything is grace. So we don't respond first. God calls us first, and then we respond to that call. So the, the reason that the Last Supper happened and the reason that the crucifixion happened and the whole Paschal mystery happened at a certain point in history is that Jesus greatly desired it. And the reason that anyone is baptized who is baptized or anyone who's saved who will be saved or is saved is because God desires it and they responded to that call. The Holy Father throughout this, um, and this isn't, I'm not going to go into a super in-depth examination of it. You can read through it yourself here. But he, he makes the point that, he wants to make the point that we do not earn this. You don't earn it. Um, there's nothing you can do. It's not because you're super good or you're super worthy, which he points out. We say that in the liturgy, uh, Domini non subdemus. I am not worthy. We say those things in the liturgy. We're not worried for that. Uh, he goes through here the absolute originality of that supper, the only truly new thing in history, which renders that supper unique. And for this reason, quote unquote, the last supper is unrepeatable. Nonetheless, his infinite desire to reestablish that communion with us that was and remains his original design will not be satisfied until every man and woman from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation shall have eaten his body and drunk his blood. That's a reference to Revelation 5.9.
And for this reason, that same supper will be made present in the celebration of the Eucharist until he returns again. So he's, he's, he's giving it here what we call an eschatological dimension, referring to the end of the age, referring to the end of things, referring to the wedding of the Lamb. The world still does not know it, I'm in paragraph five, but everyone is invited to the supper of the wedding of the Lamb. To be admitted to the feast, all that is required is the wedding garment of faith, which comes from the hearing of his word. Now, this is true. What's the issue here? If you don't read on and you want to pick at this, what's the issue? Uh, you've got to, I, I mean, the thing that I'm picking up on is uh, a, a theme that Pope Francis has seemed to advocate for in the past, which is that the Holy Communion is not like a prize for the perfect, but that Holy Communion is like a medicine for sinners or something like that. And both mm -hmm. are Perhaps both are right, but there is this uh, suggestion here that he wants to, I don't know, it's, it's uh, almost eliminate any barriers to people receiving yeah. communion. And so given what's going on in the world right now and other events of obviously, you know, Lucy was denied communion in her own diocese and you know, that that bring that kind of comes to mind here because it seems as if he's suggesting that no one should be denied communion. Yeah. And what and I think we're here with this phrase, this is why when I read this, I was like, well, it's, and he, he does come back around to it. Um, but still not as strong as I it is. Who cares what I think, but as I would like to see it, the, the problem, if you read this and some will some German speaking bishops will, or try to push this, is that all is required is faith, sola fide, and the hearing of his word. That's, so, that can fit into a Protestant model. Now there's a problem. Okay. I hear the Bible and I believe in Jesus, say I'm a Christian, whatever. Now I can be admitted to that supper, which he has already said is the Eucharist. Um, now he's not, this is not by any stretch of the imagination, heresy or not Catholic, it, it's just not, as tight as you would like to see it in the current climate. Um, all it is requires the wedding garment of faith, with faith, which comes from the hearing of his word. Now, if you understand faith in the Catholic sense of the word and the wedding garment to be your baptismal garment um, and you're, you're in communion with the church because uh, of that, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, but that's not how everybody believes. Mm -hmm. And that's not how some, especially German speaking bishops and other, hate to use the word, but liberal bishops, uh, that's not how they teach, or they, they seem to think otherwise. The church tailors such a garment to fit each one with the whiteness of a garment bathed in the blood of the Lamb. And this is true. When we come forward to receive Holy Communion, when we come to the, to the Mass, to, the, to the, the, the wedding supper of the Lamb, we must come with our garments white, bathed in the blood of the Lamb, which means no mortal sin. The problem is, again, too, nowadays, a lot of people don't like to use those old, the old terminology, like mortal sin and grave sin. Uh, actual grace, sanctifying grace, those things like that. But it, it is true. I'll continue on here. We must not allow ourselves even a moment of rest, knowing that still not everyone has received an invitation to the supper or knowing that others have forgotten it or have got lost along the way, in twists and turns of human living. This is what I spoke of when I said, quote, I dream of a missionary option that is a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything so that the church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, language and structures can be suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world rather than for her self-preservation, unquote. That's from Evangelii Gaudi. Um, I want this so that all can be seated at the supper of the sacrifice of the land and live from him. What is he saying? We still have a lot of missionary work to do. It's simply going in the world and preach the gospel and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Again, the, the language that the Holy Father Pope Francis tends to use is, is it can be a little wordy, and then you're not, you, what is he talking about? Okay. But that, I don't know what a missionary option is, but we do have missionary work to do. Um, the church is a missionary church. It always has been, it always will be. And, you know, that's <clears throat> this concept of transforming everything. And then specifically mentioning the church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, language and structures, you know, yeah. all of that. Like this is a this is 
You know, it's like revolutionary language. It's almost utopian language. You know, that, that well, you, you're right here. And it, like, I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out because this can be, again, I'm not saying Francis is doing this, but we know some bishops who are on this kick and have been since the 50s and 60s. Um, and even before that, as you said, your customs, ways of doing things, which small t traditions, really times, that's the calendar and schedules, whatever that means. Language, it's Latin uh, in, in the Roman church and structures. And we're going to talk about the structure of the mass can be suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world rather than for her self-preservation. Self-preservation, meaning the preservation of the church. Now, we know the church is preserved by the will of Christ, by the Holy Spirit. The gates of hell will not prevail. That doesn't mean the gates of hell, that it can't look like the gates of hell have prevailed if we fail at our duties. I don't know what exactly the evangelization of today's world entails. If he's going back to some of the, uh, I would say, way too optimistic language that preceded the Second Vatican Council, and during the, the Second Vatican Council, that we're going to open the, the windows of the church and it's going to be a, a new Pentecost, a new spring time. That never really took shape. Now, maybe it will. I mean, the church thinks in centuries, not decades. But um, we, we do have to be concerned with missionary work, with evangelization, as well as self-preservation. Because let's face it, in traditional Christian lands, people are falling away from the church. And people are leaving the church in droves and failing to have children and failing to get those children baptized, et cetera, et cetera. So again, I just wanted to stop there because some of this language, beginning here in paragraph five, it, it some of it's loose enough that it can be taken and twisted. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah. You know, I'm going to keep moving here. Before our response to his invitation, well before, there is his desire for us. That's true. His desire, his call precedes any initiative of our own. For he, for, We love him before he first loved us. Um, the first reason is that we are drawn there by his desire for us. Uh, for our part, the, the possible response, which is also the most demanding asceticism, is, as always, that surrender to his love, to this love, that letting ourselves be drawn by him. Indeed, every reception of communion of the body and blood of Christ was already desired by him in the Last Supper. And I would say desired by him on the cross, uh, carried through. And I think it's very good, um, paragraph 7, to begin, the content of the bread broken is the cross of Jesus, his sacrifice of obedience out of love for the Father. If we had not had the Last Supper, that is to say, if we had not had the ritual anticipation of his death, we would have never been able to grasp how the carrying out of his being condemned to death could have been, in fact, the act of perfect worship, pleasing to the Father, the only true act of worship, the only true liturgy. So this is tying the Last Supper to the, the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary. Um, and... This is something that Catholics need to be continually reminded of, that the, the Holy Sacrifice, the Mass, is a sacrifice. It is a representation of Christ's death on Calvary. Um, going down here, if uh, only a few hours after the Supper, the apostles could have seen in the cross of Jesus, if they could have borne the weight of it, what it meant for Jesus to say, quote, body offered and blood poured out. End quote. It is this of which we make memorial in every Eucharist. When the risen one returns from the dead to break the bread for the disciples at Emmaus and for his disciples who had gone back to fishing for fish and not for people in the Sea of Galilee, that gesture of breaking the bread opens their eyes. It heals them from the blindness inflicted by the horror of the cross and it renders them capable of seeing the risen one and believing in his resurrection. So what the Holy Father is saying is, the only way we can really see Jesus now is in the Eucharist. That's what we have. Um, and that the Eucharist is the, is, the, the, is the content of his cross. It is his body given on the cross. Um, I won't go any further than that. Do you have any, uh, before I keep moving? Uh, no, I've got, I've got some comments later on. Okay, I'll just keep moving here. Oh, you want to sit over here, Pedro? You can 
Only I'll do the guys with here. Nah, I'm good. I'm good here. All right. I had enough fun on the, on the camera last time. <laughs> so I'm going here. The liturgy, place of encounter with Christ. So now we're going to get to the liturgy. Here lies all the powerful beauty of the liturgy. If the resurrection were for us a concept, an idea, a thought, that the risen one were for us the recollection of the recollection of others, however authoritative, as for example, the apostles, if there were not given also to us the possibility of a true encounter with him, that would be to declare the newness of the word made flesh to have been all used up. Instead, the incarnation, in addition to being the only always new event that history knows, is also the very method that the Holy Trinity has chosen to open to us the way of communion. Christian faith is either an encounter with him alive or it does not exist. So he, as I said, he starts to reference the incarnation, which is good. So we have in holy communion, we have an encounter with the living God, Jesus Christ. If you do not have this encounter with him, as Christ said in John chapter six, I'm, I'm not, this isn't what the Holy Father said here, but as Jesus said himself, if you do not eat his flesh and drink his blood, you have no life within you. If you do not have this encounter with him in Holy Eucharist, in the Holy Communion, the sacrament, then you do not really have an encounter with the living God. His, his encounter, you do not have an encounter with the living Christ. Uh, 11, the liturgy guarantees for us the possibility of such an encounter. For us, a vague memory of the Last Supper would do no good. We need to be present at that supper to be able to hear his voice, to eat his body, to drink his blood. We need him. In the Eucharist and in all the sacraments, we, guarantee, we are guaranteed the possibility of encountering the Lord Jesus and of having the power of his paschal mystery reach us. The salvific power of the sacrifice of Jesus is every word, is every gesture, glance, and feeling reaches us through the celebration of the sacrament. So he goes on to say, I am Nicodemus, Samaritan woman. He is all these people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the Lord Jesus, who dies no more, who lives forever with the signs of his passion, continue to pardon us, heal us, save us with the power of the sacraments. It is the concrete way by means of his incarnation that he loves us. It is the way in which he satisfies his own thirst for us that he had declared from the cross. So this is good because this is against, he'll talk about a kind of Gnosticism that just over-spiritualizes everything. We have to have contact with the body and blood. One thing I would say again here where this could get a little slippery, we need to be present at that supper. That's not what the mass is really. As Benedict said, uh, the last supper is the form the giving of the bread and the wine, that's the form. But the content of the mass, sacrifice the mass is Calvary. We kneel as Western Christians, as Roman Catholics, we kneel because we are present at the crucifixion. All the symbolic gestures, the separation of the bread and the wine. This is my body, this is my blood. What happens when you separate blood from body? It's death, he's dead. And then, and then through him and with him and in him, that's the moment of the elevation, through him and with him and in him. We offer it to the Father in the Spirit. That's a sacrifice. The ringing of the bells is to draw your eyes forward to Christ to adore him, his body and blood. And then he's, he's reunited again. The host is held over the chalice. Behold the Lamb of God at J. Agnes Day. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. And then we, we, we pray together the Our Father. That's the great, you have the great Amen. All of this is because we are at Calvary spiritually. The form is the Last Supper. That's why things like Benedict spoke, spoke about this and other uh, Cardinal Sarah and other people uh, that are well informed on the liturgy. Um, the priest should stay. I don't want to get too uh, critical here, but priest should stay away from things like, like showing, showing too much or trying to reenact the Last Supper because that's not what it is. The Last Supper was for the apostles to have the means of liturgy to represent Calvary. Uh, so again, we need to be present at that supper. You could say that in a manner of speaking, but really we're present at the foot of the cross and we're present at all. In fact, the, the, the holy sacrifice, which he does go into here a little on, the, the holy sacrifice, the mass present, makes present the whole Paschal mystery, the passion, crucifixion, death, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord. That's all super contained and given to us. Um, that's, that's the power of it. Um, if you have something, just go ahead. I'll not. I'll keep uh, just go get stuff later on. Okay. I'll just keep going through here and then we'll see how far yep. we can get. 
Paragraph 12, our first encounter with his paschal deeds is the event that marks the life of all believers, our baptism. So I'm glad that was included. You do need to be baptized. This is not a mental adhesion to assault or agreeing to a code of conduct imposed by him. Rather, it is a being plunged into his passion, death, resurrection, and ascension. Here he goes with the paschal deed. That is true. Baptism, we are, we die with Christ, we're buried with him, and we rise again. So it is a washing away of sins, but it's also an intimate participation in his passion. It is not magic. So what is magic there? He goes a little bit here. Magic is like a magician, a wizard, is trying to control God or control the gods. If I say the right word, I draw the right symbol, I do the right thing, I can control the spirits. Uh, there's all kinds of magic things around us today. I spoke with a Buddhist today. Well, I don't know Buddhist, no, so maybe, but uh, there's other, there's other Ooh, things. Yeah, yeah, elephant with an eye. Yeah. The eye is supposed to represent that it keeps away evil, and then the elephant is supposed to... Uh, was that what supposed to do? Oh, yeah. Help you overcome any problems or issues you have. What the hell is going to do that? <laughs> so <laughs> he says magic is the opposite of the logic of the sacraments because it pretends to have power for God. It comes from the tempter, meaning it comes from Satan. I kind of like that. I haven't heard anyone put it that way before, and I haven't heard him say anything like that. Like, like magic is the opposite of the logic of the sacraments. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. So it shows that, that, yeah, it, 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 so there is. And, and, and per, again, I don't want to get sidetracked, but per usual, per usual Pope Francis, you get this a lot of really, wow, that's really, really good. And then, uh, <laughs> it's a little sideways. A little, yeah. I, he writes, uh, Benedict XVI wrote like he wrote. Pope Francis writes like he speaks. And then it's like, it's a little tangential sometimes. It comes, it's really good. And then it trails off. He writes like a Jesuit, I guess, a modern Jesuit. I mean, he is a Jesuit. Um, and Benedict writes like a German theologian. Mm -hmm. So that's, if you're comparing it to, it's not really fair. But so that's really good. This is not magic. There's some of the Protestants, some of the others accuse us of believing in magic. The atheists accuse us of believing in a sky daddy or something. It's not, it's not it at all. We I believe know, in the logos. Not. We believe in the logic of the sacraments. We believe in a mystical encounter that's not irrational, it's super rational. It's above reason. It's completely reasonable, it just goes above that. Um, in perfect continuity with the incarnation, there is given to us in virtue of the presence and action of the spirit, the possibility of dying and rising in Christ. So that's, that's good. So tying it there all the way back to baptism is tied with our death and our own death and resurrection in Christ. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ who lives in me, as St. Paul said. 13, how moving the way in which this comes about. The prayer for the blessing of the baptismal water reveals to us that God created water precisely with baptism in mind. This means that when God created water, he was thinking of the baptism of each one of us. And this same thought accompanying him all throughout his acting in the history of salvation. Every time that with precise intention, he used water for saving work. So he... Back here, you have the face of the waters of the deep in Genesis. He used water to regenerate human humanity through the flood, the children of Israel moving through the Red Sea, et cetera, et cetera. This is good. What this does is makes the creation of the world a sacramental act. And we've lost some of this in Christianity. We've lost some of this idea that we, we tend to sometimes go toward a gross materialism. Even if, you even if you don't believe in any kind of evolutionary process, even if you believe in special creation, we tend to fall into this trap of where we believe that, well, that's just a matter. Rocks, water, earth, air, the molecules did that and made Adam out of it. And then later here, Jesus chose to use some of these things because we haven't, no, it's the opposite's true. The sacrament, the kingdom of God, the presence <coughs> of Christ, the spirit was in mind when he made that. When he made water, it's true, we needed to drink, plants needed to grow. But in mind was the kingdom of God, was baptism, was regeneration, was new life. Um, even before the fall, in, in mind right? was, the, was the, com the complete summing up of all things in Christ, the spiritualizing of all matter. And so I like that. Some other people might not like it, but I, I think that's a very good way to think of it. That's one way I would think of it. And we know the church fathers, we've talked about that before, the church fathers... We know the, the, the typology of going through the Red Sea. And, and uh, Peter talks about um, being saved um, 
as Noah was saved through the flood, so we are saved through baptism. Um, so I think that's good. That's that's a way to look at the universe in a spiritual way that is healthy, that doesn't go into pantheism or magic or new ageism. It's a healthy way to look at God, how God made the universe uh, with our souls in mind is one way you could put it. Uh, the church sacrament of the body of Christ. So here he, be, he first references uh, the Second Vatican Council. As Vatican Council II remind us, and this is from the uh, from Sacrosanctum Concilium, uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium is is a good document. If you haven't read Sacrosanctum Concilium, you should read it. Uh, he cites the scriptures, uh, citing the scriptures, fathers, and the liturgy, the pillars of authentic tradition. It was from the side of Christ as he slept the sleep of death upon the cross that there came forth the wondrous sacrament of the whole church. We are ourselves a sacrament. The church is a sacrament. Remember, what's the definition of sacrament? Uh, holy order, sign from God, instituted with grace. Uh, I forget the technical. Definition. Yeah, it's basically a physical, a physical reality that makes present an invisible spiritual reality. Um, hmm. So we, you have in each of the seven sacraments the form and matter. You need the water just as much as you need the Holy Spirit because it makes it present. The oil makes, you know, that that's what it is. So the church makes presence. God, the wondrous sacrament of the church came from the side when blood and water came out. The parallel between the first Adam and the new Adam is striking. As from the side of the first Adam, after having cast him into a deep sleep, God draws forth Eve. So also from the side of the new Adam, sleeping the sleep of death on the cross, there's born the new Eve, the church, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I wonder if he had in mind, he recently made uh, Irenaeus a doctor of the church. Uh, this is uh, a lot of this is discussed here in St. Irenaeus talks about that. Well, this and this phrase here, the footnote he has to the, the quote, the wondrous sacrament of the whole church. Mm -hmm. The footnote is to it's actually a CF, um, which at least when we use it legally means compare, not mm -hmm. actually like a site to it. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, he, it's to Augustinus, Augustinus which maybe is St. Augustine, and I don't know, I don't know, uh, in their rationist, in Salmos, I don't recognize these, these uh, words or who's, who used that phrase. I'm not sure. Oh, I'm some, not sure. Some Augustine, then. You think? Yeah. Okay. Can I see that? Yeah, yeah. I don't, have, I don't want to scroll down here. Yeah, I didn't look at all the footnotes. Which one is it for? For Augustinus. Augustinus and Salmos. Yeah. Yeah, that is so. So it's from Augustine, but that's that's a very church father way of looking at it. Okay, we've heard that before. Um, <clears throat> Fifteen. Without this incorporation, there is no possibility of living the fullness of the worship of God. In fact, there is only one act of worship, perfect and pleasing to the Father, namely the obedience of the Son. The measure of which is His death on the cross. The only possibility of being able to participate in His offering is by becoming sons in the Son. This is the gift that we have received. The subject acting in the liturgy is always and only Christ Church, the mystical body of Christ. This is very good. The only real act of worship that there is in the universe is the Son offering it, it as it relates to us, at least it, what we call the, the economy of uh, Trinitarian economy, is the, the Son offering himself to the Father in the Spirit. And that's what the Mass is. That's why we're required to go to the Mass. It's good that we hear the Bible read. It's good that we get together. It's good that we receive. So that's why even if you're in a, a, in a state of, if you're not in a state to receive Holy Communion, you still have to go to Mass because you still have to participate in that perfect act of worship. People will often say, why can't I stay at home and pray? Or why can't I go to the, the, the other church or watch it on TV? Why can't I go hiking and do it on a mountaintop or do it? We pray there. It's not the same because you have to be there with the church Offering the Father, or excuse me, offering the Son to the Father in the Spirit. Uh, so that's very good. Uh, if you don't have any, I'll keep moving here. The theological sense of liturgy. We owe to the council, this is referring to the, it's funny now, that's the count, that's the only council yeah, that exists now. Right, yes, right. He, he does that. He always refers to A lot to of people. The, yeah. yeah, it's the, it's, it's it. In fact, that's the last, the only one. That, anyway. We owe to the council and to the liturgical movement that preceded it. Um, 
there's a lot that could, I don't have time to go into the, the liturgical movement. Uh, a, a lot of good came out of that and a lot of that whole movement, I won't go into it. Maybe we could talk about it later. Splintered in, itself into a, a conservative and liberal camp. And the rediscovery of a theological understanding of the liturgy and its importance in the life of the church. I guess I'll take his word for it. I'm not sure that how much there was not already a theological understanding of the liturgy. Um, I, I don't know in what way he means that. Uh, anyway, as the general principles spelled out in Sacrosancta Concilium have been fundamental for the reform of the liturgy, they continue to be fundamental for the promotion of that full, conscience, active, and fruitful celebration. In the liturgy, quote, the primary and indispensable source from which the faithful are to derive the true Christian spirit, end quote. That's very true. Now, here's this. Again, I don't know how much that there wasn't already a theological understanding of liturgy. I will say this, whatever you think of Vatican II and, and some of the cheerleaders for Vatican II or the spirit of Vatican II since then, sometimes, two things. Sometimes we can be very unfair to them if we're critical of them, um, applying uh, things that happen afterward, you know, uh, blaming them for it. But also, th these people aren't alive to defend them. But anyway, th there's also, un I think, unjustly critical of what was going on before the council, um, the great theologians that were around before the council, that there was, there was, a, great, there, there was a great liveliness in the church despite a lot of problems. There was a theological understanding of the liturgy. Um, and the, I would say the council fathers knew that. They weren't out to toss everything away. They, they, were, they were out to, um, they were out for a, a genuine reform. Now, however that worked out, and I'll, I'll get to that. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, some people that are, have no idea about the history of the church in the, in the early 20th century or what happened before the council might think that it was just, um, it was just completely dry and dead before the council. And, and there, were, there, were, there were people in America, really, especially who, who pushed that that narrative that's just not true and uh, that they had to make these drastic changes, but I'll get to the changes. Uh, full conscious, active and fruitful celebration. Every Christian, every Catholic participating in the mass should have a full conscious, active and fruitful celebration. That does not mean by the way that you have to have your voice be heard always and be doing everything. So that's an error that, that has slowly crept in and just won't go away that when I go to mass, I have to do everything. I have to be a part of it. I have to do some kind of job in the sanctuary. If, so, if the pastor, whoever says something I approve of, I have to clap really loud, um, things like that. It's, and uh, there, I don't, there's no place for that. You know, uh, that's that. Let me just <clears throat> jump back. Yeah, you want to go? Because where are you at? Uh, 52. Okay, let's jump over that. Good. because we talk about the you know how much you need to be heard and do things at mass and he does here in 52 talk about the to some degree the importance of silence you know among the ritual acts that belong to the whole assembly silence occupies a place of absolute importance many times it is expressly prescribed in the rubrics the entire Eucharistic celebration is immersed in the silence which precedes its beginning and which marks its every moment of its ritual unfolding. So there's, he even comes to say, um, where is it? Such silence is not an inner haven in which to hide oneself in some sort of intimate isolation, as if leaving the ritual form behind as a distraction. That kind of silence would contradict the essence itself of the celebration, Liturgical silence, that's a new term, I think, or not one that I'm familiar with. Liturgical silence is something much more grand. It is a symbol of the presence and action of the Holy Spirit who animates the entire action of the celebration. So I don't, I, I am glad to see him reference the fact that active participation does not mean that we shouldn't have silence, but I'm not sure exactly what he's talking about here because it sounds like liturgical silence 
is different from meditation, the intimate isolation that you might engage in. And we obviously, we have this big distinction between if you go to the new mass, there is almost never any silence. There really are no moments of silence. Perhaps after you receive Holy Communion, you might have a moment of silence, but usually they are playing something on the, you know, there's the communion hymn. Whereas the old mass does have so much of it's in silence and you don't hear it. And large parts of the, the mass are in silence and it gives you a chance to engage in what I think is a good intimate isolation to some degree. So that's what I was saying is a good intimate isolation. Well, that's, he seems to be criticizing it. He's saying that you should not hide yourself in some sort of intimate isolation. Uh, intimate isolation. I think, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. if you look that's at the beginning like. of 52, uh, you, you already be. read, um, silence is absolutely important. Many times it's expressly prescribed in the rubrics. It is. The other problem is, as you pointed to, a lot of priests fly through it. And that was one of the problems they wanted to address at the council. I, I said this, I right. think, here before. Your average American Catholic, and probably European Catholic, mostly if only ever experienced a low mass because low mass. the low the lower that distinction doesn't exist anymore a low mass and a high mass or sung mass the low mass was usually the first of the day and they're fasting since midnight or they want to go do stuff they'll go to the low mass bada boom bada bing it, the priest can fly through it 40 minutes yeah. Yeah. no homily so even on sunday some, or yeah. maybe the bare homily and that was a problem too that's why it began, it began to be a, a practice that people would pray the rosary. Mm -hmm. And that can be an issue. I'm not saying it's wrong to pray the rosary. I'm just not, I'm just saying the rosary maybe to make up for time loss of the man. Because you feel like you're okay. detached from the action at the altar, completely detached. Or I'm not saying everyone who prays the rosary or does other things is doing this, but maybe you feel like not that you're completely detached, but I don't matter or we don't matter or that doesn't matter. That's uh, I think that's what he's talking about. Yeah, now, I don't know how I wasn't nice. around then, uh, but I, you know, you hear all the stories about the guys would be out smoking cigarettes till a certain point and guys yeah. come in, they fly through it. Um, well, sadly, with with the mass of Paul the Sixth, a lot of you go to a lot of places. How many times do you hear the Roman canon with all the with all the martyrs and all the saints? Oh, no, like uh, uh, how often do you hear that? How often do you see, do you smell incense? How often do you get all that? And how often does wow. someone take, and, and at the point in the canon when it says, uh, I probably smell more than incense at Baptist church. Incense at the Baptist church? Uh, I never had it. I smell uh, more yeah. at uh, uh, Hot Topic. You know? been, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, I've been, yeah. I've been to, I've been, I used to go like, uh, it was, yeah, I think there was one of them. Yeah, I smell the incense. Uh, we never used it. Incense. I smell yeah. that in those But um, <laughs> what was I saying? That, that, at the point where you remember the dead, it's supposed to be a silence. There. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you'll some priests will do it. There's supposed to be periods of silence. What's the problem with that though? Even if the priest wants to, it begins to get smaller and smaller the longer they're there. Why? Because people don't like that. Right. Well, where's what's going on? Because they're waiting for the next thing to happen, or the priest just gets too used to it. And remember, when you're this is a separate issue, but when you're facing the people and it's all in the vernacular, it's only human nature to start to play act a little bit and to keep let's get this show on the road, especially Americans. Man. Yeah. It's know. about being <laughs> yeah, yeah. people in the pews expect some sort of entertainment, like they expect, and they'll ask themselves the afterwards. Jesus. Or they'll complain, perhaps, afterwards. I myself was definitely guilty of this years ago, where you would go to Mass and you'd say, I didn't get anything out of that. And now I look at myself and I'm, I can't believe I ever thought that because it's not about getting something out of it. It's about actually giving something. You're sacrificing. You're engaging in the representation of Calvary. You know, like you're giving something to the Lord in the most holy way you can. Yeah. Um, One thing I was thinking about breaking of the bread is something that it's something that's discussed in the Bible. It was done in Last Supper. So why do people think that it's not okay to eat the bread and body of Christ? Uh, they, a lot of people think that it's okay. They just don't believe it's really Jesus. Oh, that's really blood. okay. It's a symbol. Yeah, that's another issue. But uh, I'll close okay. out here. Um, maybe we can do a part 
to it or not. Or, but anyway, we went through some of it. Um, there are there are some issues that here here I think is the big problem that the Pope and the Church is facing right now. Um, even if you want to get so he 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 keeps quoting Sacrosanctum Concilium, and he he addresses. We didn't get to go through all this. Um, is this a whole book? A little longer than it, looks, it has to it be. Like but anyway, book. we didn't get... It, it's a whole letter. It's a letter. Yeah. To, to, uh, to all Augustus. of us. It says it's Augustine the beginning. On that to, to the whole the people the of the council. church. No, this oh, is... Pope oh, Francis just oh. released this letter. No, so this is to new. To all of us. Yeah, it came out yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. Wow. wow. Just hit the streets. I wonder how long so it took me to write that. That's great. Um, one of the problems is this. Uh, this what what we ex are experiencing now in the so-called Novus Ordo ain't what Sacrosanctum Concilium called for. Right. There is a complete disconnect, and the problem is everybody knows that. So they keep saying like the 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 reforms of Vatican II, the reforms of Vatican II, or we got to do this that. There was a council during and after a committee, excuse me, during and after the council that shaped. You probably heard of this with. Bunini, yep. all that, yeah. all that jazz that completely took a lot of what even the, the Vatican Council, the Council called for, and just reworked it. There's stuff that the Council didn't call for. There's stuff that is improvised, uh, and, and sometimes things happen organically. But this was decided by a committee. Um, some people have said very Protestantized. Uh, <clears throat> very streamlined. There, there were. There's a lot. I won't go into all that. Okay, but what it ended up doing is the law of prayer becomes a law of belief. Lex orandi, lex credendi, and you have these things which were not according to the council, which were decided by a committee, which have been even subject to further abuses in the church. So now we're in a bad state right now when it comes to the liturgy in the Roman Catholic in the Roman rite, because you have purists and traditionalists who are married and loyal and seemingly would die for the old mass. And a lot of uh, people, we often say younger people, but it is a lot of younger people are drawn to that because- I, mean, I like the new mass. Because there's that. a legit, there's, yeah, well, that's fine. It's catching up to yeah. it. The new mass went back in time, basically, from what I was told. It's supposed to be getting- Well, that was the idea. Closer to Latin That was mass. the idea to go back to something more primeval, something Prime, that yeah. more apostolic. Apostolic. But what you experience a lot of places isn't that at all. It's it's nothing. Nothing. It's something, like, no, nothing it, like that at all. Not that it's nothing. It's something completely new. Oh. And there's well, some issues new. also with saying we're gonna go back because you can't go back. You know, it's the analogy of the tree. You can't turn the tree back. So the, the way the mass changes is based off of the council itself. Well, some of it seems to be, but there was a committee that changed some things. So you have a lot of problems. Anyway, to to wrap this up, the problem Pope Francis has and uh, others who want to really strongly implement the reform and keep it there and kind of move move away from the old rights is that what we are experiencing is not authentically what was described at the second vatican council and there is in certain in, in certain areas there seems to be a break with tradition and in those ways it can potentially be harmful to people's faith it can potentially uh, give give the faithful a a wrong view of what liturgy is, and he talks about that in here. Uh, even with the rubrics of the new mass, a lot of priests don't follow them, or they don't understand them, or they just seem to not care. Um, and and we're not and we're not talking about validity. Was well, it a valid mass? Is it a real Eucharist? That's not what we're talking about. There's there's he talks about beauty and truth and. And things like that. That's one of the problems he's going to have to deal with. Because if you're going to suppress the old mass, and you're going to do like other bishops, I think very wrongly have done, and so you can't even have ad orientum in the new mass. They've gotten rid of ad orientum. They, in some places, you're oppressed if you want to receive communion, kneeling, and on the tongue. Um, they've gotten rid of Latin altogether. And, and no, that's right. Kneeling on the tongue. Yeah. yeah, yeah and the Vatican, right. Second Vatican Council said Latin should remain. It's, the, it's our liturgical heritage. It's our liturgical language. All those things should remain. But they, so he's, 
got a problem to deal with here. I don't think this apostolic letter addresses as much as it should. Uh, there's a lot of good things in it. Uh, we're going to have to wrap up looking through it here. Um, one thing that just stood out here, this is maybe I shouldn't even bring it up here, but this phrase here, presiding, the presider, that's a big problem. They, the, the priest is the celebrant. He celebrates the sacrifice of the mass. He's not the pres he, he is technically a presider. What presider sounds like is I'm just presiding over the thing and we're all doing it. Mm -hmm. No, he is the celebrant. So moving forward in the liturgy, we have to return to some of these so they said that more the ancient the concepts of the necessity of the priest, the special nature of the priest, uh, that it is a sacrifice. Um, and and that things like form and tradition and, and beauty, things like that matter. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to, uh, so again, I think I didn't, we didn't get to go through all of this, but it's kind of, it's, uh, it's worth reading as all, as all you should read, you know, Catholics should read if something comes out from the Holy Father. Don't be taken by it. Well, when did that happen? What do you mean? What's going on? Well, um, it's addressed to the bishops, priests, deacons, consecrated men, women, and to all the lay faithful. So it's addressed. It's like the Holy Father has written a letter to all of us. Um, and it's it's worth Where reading. You get this letter but I don't. Online, you just put. Yeah, like, go, you, you just Google, Google it. You find it. You go to the Vatican website. <laughs> Liturgy. Yeah, just put apostolic yeah. letter, Francis. It'll come up. No, but like this is yesterday. Like I didn't. How? Like where do you go to get the updated? You know what I mean? It's probably gonna drop another letter soon. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think it'll be dropping another one that quick. It doesn't right. come out that. Yeah. If you don't see it in the news, you can, like, you can look up. Um, you know, there's certain websites that have yeah, just Catholic, Catholic news. Morning. Yeah. Catholic news okay. Well, some, some, most of them are good, but some of them aren't necessarily good. So you got to be careful where you're. Yeah, where I'm trying to figure out where you guys got this. But this, but this, this is, is this is literally from the Vatican website. Okay, Vatican website. You can just website. go to like it's like Vatican.ca or something. Yeah, like I'm the Vatican.com. Yeah, Warren, when did you get here? I just got here a little, like maybe like. I, it ended up that what I thought was the seventh uh, seven thirty session was a six thirty session, so I just kind of had about uh, at whatever uh, the end of that was. I guess it was seven thirty ish. I dropped in. So, so who's who's driving North Carolina? South Carolina. Tom. Oh, Tom. They're going to a wedding. Everybody's getting married. Yeah. Um, any comments, questions? Oh, Tom, no, I would just say. I mean the the. 30, paragraph 31 is the one that's got a lot of attention. And that is the one where he reaffirms traditionis custodis, he expresses some frustrations over people who, as he says, doesn't don't accept the quote liturgical reform. So it's something else to be talked about. Um, and it, I think a lot of people see it as a signal. I think it could be a lot worse. He, uh, he's allowing a lot of mask. Well, for people like me who really have come to know my faith better and through through the Latin Mass, um, I'd be very concerned if he prohibited it. And so that's what it is, prohibiting Latin Mass. It's not it yet. He, conversations about it. That Traditionis Custodis letter was one that, that was a motu proprio. It was an order from him he issued last July, about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot shorter than this. And it basically said, what you can and you can't do with the Latin rite, with the old Latin mass. And it was very concerning because it seemed as if he was trying to stop Latin anyone mass. from doing it. This letter picks up on that um, in that it, it, it refers to it and it says, again, he sort of expresses his frustration that some people would, not, would, would want to gravitate to the Latin mass rather than to the new mass. And so that's, that's of concern. You know, that is got to keep keep our eyes open. It's like 50, 50 though, because it's like once the Latin Mass was introduced to me, it was something I adapted to. But but at first when it was like Latin Mass, I was just like, oh, like that's gonna be that's beyond me. Like that's 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 too much. That's too hard to comprehend or be able to keep up with. But then you adapt to it. 
Yeah, and you know what the thing is, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what it's supposed to do. Hmm. Like, you th there's not really anything new in it, and uh, it's got some good teaching. Yeah, he says somewhere in here, but unless prompts. I'm missing, unless I'm missing something, now I just I didn't read it in depth, and we didn't even go through all of it. Um, so I. Okay. I don't know. That's it. There's no bomb. There's no bombshell, or there's no like you just re reiterating of good teaching. That's good. Um, like a bombshell. The, the the priest <laughs> would do well to listen to it. Follow the rubrics. It's not a race. Uh, it's not a picnic. Um, we are supposed to be involved actively. I'm not sure. Again, the things like there's sometimes so Francis will use phrases. Yeah, you're involved at mass. You're yeah, not just there way, as a spectator. But no silence. No, there is silence. But again, he uses phrases that I don't, I'm not sure what it means, like liturgical silence as opposed to. Now, I, I guess I can see what that means, or like a missionary option. Like you're scrolling down and let's try choose missionary. Like it's not. Um, it, it sometimes, sometimes, in the modern church. The churchmen, when they write documents, can sound a little bit too much like it's coming from like an HR, a little bit, uh, <laughs> which does it doesn't speak to people, and it's just. I well, know. also, I mean, I, I maybe I'm just focused on thirty-one because <laughs> I'm worried about the Latin mass. Whereas, perhaps there are people who really love the Novus Ordo mass, the new mass, and they look at the comments about silence. And they're like offended by that, you know, like, like, whereas, or worried about it. Whereas I'm worried about his comments negatively reflecting on the Latin mass. Maybe there are people who are worried about his comments negatively reflecting on the fact that there's not enough silence or not enough kneeling or not enough reverence. He talks about that in the new mass. And so I hope, I hope that the new mass is kind of brought into conformance with what I think the council intended, which was it's still supposed to be reverent. It's yeah, still right. supposed well, that's, to have that's, silence. Say, I don't think there would be I can't know. Who knows now? It's been so it's too I'm far removed. Church is silent. But a lot of the rupture that happened afterward, not only with the SSPX, but some other things, and there were left wing ruptures, and a lot of this other stuff can be traced back to the liturgy, a lot of it. There's other factors going on. And a lot of this wouldn't even be an issue, I don't think, if the liturgy that the council fathers foresaw would have been implemented instead of this, this Bunini uh, committee liturgy. And then that thing, that thing just sprouted and became its own. I mean, it, it took, it took th through John Paul II and then Benedict, like pulling back something, like, you can't do this, you can't do this stop doing these things stop doing that because some of it's just really wild and then and, you know i'm shocked because even in the diocese we're in you can go to any mass for the most part and it's it's pretty good uh you go some places and it's just a mess mm. i mean the church is a mess the church looks like a flying saucer lamp <laughs> you can't find a tabernacle the artwork screams uh 1978 Right, it's like Abba. It, 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 uh, never been there's there. no, yeah. Good luck worship. I don't know who, what I'm supposed to worship in there, but it's not. <laughs> Try. You know what's interesting? <laughs> One thing that's good, like it's it's interesting I mean, if you look at like um, the guys at like uh, the the Seton Shrine. Like if you look at like their uh, Pentecost uh, liturgy, like there was a ton of incense. Like they processed in, they incensed the uh, the book. Um, the priest sang the gospel in England, you know, chanted the gospel. Like it's a lot of elements that are like from, you know, things that you'd be used to in Latin mass were there. And like, so when it's like that, I'm like, that looks pretty good. Like, and, and they have a, uh, you receive people, a lot of people receive on the tongue. They use uh patents, you know, or, you know, communion plate, whatever you want to call it underneath uh, people. So there's a lot of like, you know, many other elements that are kind of, that you never almost never see that you never see that the, the priest go around yeah. the altar the incense usually but, yeah. but that's possible it's possible for that to be in the room it's right yeah it's completely it's completely doable it's yeah. complete i served at a mass on friday for the sacred heart it was a 6 p.m mass it was like a daily mass style mass 
like 25 people there. But we used incense, uh, singing, and then there was adoration afterward with, with all of that. And it's not only possible, I don't know why it's not done. There's no good reason. And if the problem is there are more Roman Catholics than other kinds of Catholics. Why are we the ones that have to get emaciated liturgically? Like you don't, it's not, you go to a, a Ukrainian or a Byzantine yes, right. or wherever. It's not an, I, no one's so old, you know, father's using incense and there's, there's singing and the deacon looks, it's just what it is. But we've been, here's some of the problem. People that are really, they really want to, they really love God. They really want to, they really are devout. Um, the problem is they've been given in a lot of places, they've been given a cotton candy liturgy for so long that when you take away some of the, the candy, they, they want a claw, you know, because it's things like incense and, and the chant and the, uh, the beauty of it, they're not used to getting it. So they, they, they're they like allergic to, don't, I'm, I, you know, I feel secure because, you know, they've been, they've been stuck in that. I don't know what, I don't know what possessed anybody to inflict some of these things on the Roman right. Uh, I, I don't know, like you should, I mean, we're the we're the biggest group, right? We're the biggest group. Make the make the Maronites yeah. with the crappy. No, uh, no. They, they were very nice. But, you know, they even did that up at the uh, at the at the one of the grotto shrines. They had them the Maronites do some of their seeing there. I mean, yeah. so like, you can have like um, you know, there, I guess there's. I hope that was uh, that was that was an interesting mass where they had like the Maronite chants right in the middle of the Novus Ordo, which was interesting. Um, but it's, but it was, but it was, but you know, it, it, there's, there's a potential that, you know, you can see, you know, um, you know, like the, the, the guys, like, and even the quality of the sermons, like the guys of the scene shrine, like they'll really give like a very doctrinal sermon that really has meat to it. That has like stuff about the interior life. There's all this like stuff. And it's like, I think that's another piece is like, are people being fed, um, in terms of like, are they getting a homily that is transmitting, you know, the traditional understandings, the, the really weighty things from the faith, you know, and that's, I think, another problem too, is it's not only, it's not only the liturgy, it's also that whole sensibility of the, the faith not being transmitted sometimes. Good. So let's wrap it up because uh, we ran over a little bit. Uh, Becky Warren and Tom for coming. Uh, Kevin, Pedro. So we'll uh, say a prayer and be... Ooh. It's going to be right up your nose. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was, it was in the, the beginning, it is now, and it shall, shall be world without end. end. Amen. Holy martyrs, pray for, pray for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Adios.